my presentation today is on the sustainability in business and how it applies to our lives and how we may impact it in our individual and personal careers. So the influence for why I'm here, of course, is that you know, she's the reason I'm here, she's the reason all of you are here. And she's also the reason I'm giving this presentation. When I tell people that I want to be involved in sustainability in business, you know, they look at me and they say, yeah, that's cool. But they actually have no idea what I want to do. And so what I'm here to do is try to describe what it is to be a sustainable business and the type of opportunities that exist in sustainable business. Today's inspiration for me was really from research that I've done concerning business and from teachings that I've received on two renowned experts in sustainable futures. This is Paul Hawkins and Andrew Lovitz. And they've really inspired me to kind of demonstrate the value of sustainability in our careers. The presentation that I've designed today is meant more so to inspire you than to kind of raise awareness to the harsh reality that we face. Um, I did this to demonstrate the best of the best of sustainability that's going on um, in our career paths and in our future. So for my presentation, I define sustainability as you can see on the screen. But in order to achieve sustainability, we're really looking at sacrifice. We're looking at our ability to kind of put the needs of the few behind the needs of the many. Too often in our business and our career, we're pursuing greed and self-interest. And that's something that we need to get away from. In order to achieve environmental, social, and economic restoration, we have to take a holistic approach to sustainability. We have to be able to rationalize that, you know, in order to sustain our quality of living that we're so, you know, accustomed to and that we so desire to have, we have to make necessary changes. And then, you know, from sustainability in business, we'll create ethical job creation, economic restoration, and environmental coexistence. And if we can pursue these opportunities immediately, then we drastically increase our success in the future. The points on the screen are kind of ideas that we should think about when we're looking at sustainability. But in order to achieve it, we need to make the sacrifices and we need to make intelligent decisions. Early human didn't necessarily survive and win the evolutionary race because we were the strongest or because we were the most intelligent. That certainly wasn't the entire case. We survived and we thrived because we were social. We were a social structure and we were able to put the needs of the group for our person. In order to do this, we have to rationalize the safety of our future, and I think that that's something that we're getting away from today, and that's a very dangerous place to be. Early humans did destroy the environment, we destroyed and eradicated species, we relied on those species, we relied on our natural resources to get us to where we are today. And the farther we get away from that, the more dangerous our future becomes. So I have to pose the question, how sustainable can such a society be? where we're constantly prioritizing the interests of the few over the needs of the many. What I hope to demonstrate today is the fundamental changes and sacrifices that are possible and the things that are going on today in the business industries. And hopefully you can find a way to apply this to your life, whether you're destined for business or not. I think that the ideas that I'll go over today are both applicable to personal and career lives. So the first, area of, uh, the first area of sustainability that I want to discuss today is product development and design. When we're looking at product development and design, we're trying to get away from a throwaway society. We're trying to create products that have high utility, which is essentially the satisfaction we receive from the product. We're also trying to have high quality and high durability products, products that stay out of our landfills. Anybody in this room can conceptualize an idea for something that can just be thrown in the landfill you know, the perfect example is the napkin or the, the plastic cup. But it takes real intelligence and real genuine genius to create a product that's averted from our landfills. And that's half the challenge. And products and services are essentially the entire root cause of what, we, what we're dealing with in sustainability. Everything derives from our need and our desire, the creation of what we want. So when we develop and consider the design process, <coughs> we have to do so in a manner that doesn't disrupt the natural systems of the earth, and that in a manner that's more sustainable for the future. There are two companies that I want to demonstrate today who are particularly great in this aspect. So this is Toto. They're a Japanese manufacturer of ceramic plumbing 
you know, it's not the most glorious uh, type of operation. It's kind of a mundane thing that we don't really think about concerning sustainability. But they've been capable of designing products to some extent that can reduce water usage by 80% in their, in their use. And Toto hasn't just been an industry leader in resource efficiency um, in product design. They've also been able to reduce their waste stream quite significantly. Beyond the water initiatives, um, which I can demonstrate here, they've been able to reduce their waste streams entirely. You know, they've closed the loop of design. And essentially what they're doing is they're taking their products and they're using material in those products that can be used in other industries. So when waste is created, they can find a use for it somewhere else. And the perfect example of this is the ceramic and porcelain waste that they do generate is used by tiling manufacturers. So tiles come out of the waste that sort of generates. But there's a, there's a difference between development and new product design. Product design is taking something completely new and solving an old problem. And that's what Fox Fiber was able to do. Fox Fiber was a company founded by Sally Fox. And she was able to naturally breed cotton so that it was naturally colored. And this reduced a significant problem in the cotton industry. It's a very resource intensive industry. And when we're dying and manufacturing cotton, it's generating a lot of toxic chemicals, a lot of pollutants. And that's something that we haven't been able to deal with in the past. But Sally was able to create a cotton that was naturally colored. And she was successful in creating cubes of brown, orange, green, and pink. But Sally was also kind of on accident able to create a product that was more resilient to pesticides and insects, or pests and insects rather. And she was able to completely eliminate, in most cases, the need for harmful pesticides and harmful insecticides. She was actually able to use natural predatory insects to take care of her problems when it was when they were dealing with the harvesting. <coughs> so what Sally was able to do was not only reduce the resource needs of the cotton industry, but she's able to create a zero poison and a zero toxic operation. So the next area of discussion that I want to go over today is waste reduction and resource efficiency. So when we're talking about resource efficiency and waste reduction, we're kind of talking about things that exist in our current infrastructure without reinventing a company, without reshaping the wheel. Pollution and waste are completely accepted and almost entirely legal to some extent, but the reason we put up with it is because we don't want to sacrifice the economic trade-offs that are associated with dealing with our waste streams for what seem to be relatively small economic or environmental benefits. But if we can increase our rationalization that the environment is more important than those trade-offs, then maybe we'll make some progress. So what we're talking about here is inefficient technology, inefficient buildings, and things that just go unnoticed. Things that already exist in areas of business, in the existing infrastructure, and in our existing operation. There's significant room for improvement without us having to reinvent an entire company. This is a company that was founded by Ray Anderson. He was inspired by Paul Walker just as I was, and that's the reason that I'm here today. Ray Anderson's company is called Interface Incorporated, and what they do is they make carpet products. You know, again, this is sort of a mundane, something that goes under the radar, and not really considered in the sustainable industry. He's been a leader in sustainable development and waste reduction. It's estimated that in six years' time, uh, Ray Anderson, a global company at Interface, will source all of its energy from 100% renewable resources. And beyond that, Interface has been a significant leader in the industry of waste reduction. In 1996, they sent over 12.5 million pounds of waste to the land. But just last year, they were able to reduce that number to only 2 million pounds. And 2 million pounds is nothing to change. It's still a lot of waste. But it's a testament to the fact that we can do it. And it's a testament to the fact that we're getting closer at reducing our entire waste streams. And in order to do this sort of thing, they've implemented life cycle analysis and dematerialization. Dematerialization the ability of a company to take the materials that they're using to, to 
to make some sort of product, reduce the input, and still have the same output. And that type of analysis is going over the entire process of the product, where it comes from and where it's going. You're cutting out all individual wastes that are associated with that process. And Interface has done a great job with this, but they don't nearly compare to the company that I'm about to recognize. Uh, these are the Menominee Foresters. And the Menominee Foresters are a tribal land, uh, a tribal people on a reservation land in Wisconsin. And what they've been able to do is implement sustainable harvesting of forest resources to an extent that's never been seen before. For 140 years, they've harvested uh, timber products from their own forest. Um, without decreasing the amount of timber in that forest, without degrading the ecosystem to any extent. With zero waste and unheard of resource efficiency, you know, the life cycle of the foresters is unprecedented. And it's a testament to the fact that we can not only harvest sustainable resources, but it's actually extremely profitable to do so. And the beautiful thing is that these ancient practices have been recognized the world over. Um, some of you may know of the FSC, um, the Forest Stewardship Council. All of the ideology that the FSC has taken has come from the nominee people's ideologies. Their best practices have been made into other best practices and ways of gauging the forestry industry. And to give you an idea of the extent to which they've been so successful, um, if you imagine 234,000 acres of forest. Um, the Menominee people over 140 years have taken that forest and they've taken all the timber off of it. So if you can imagine if you're cutting that entire forest, that two times over action, that's the amount of resources they've been able to sustainably harvest over their life cycle. And actually, the most amazing thing about that fact is that 160 years ago, when the reservation was founded, there was less timber in that forest than there is today. And that's an amazing fact when you look at the clear cutting operations that exist in the forestry industry, such as the picture that's shown. And the final thing that we want to go over when, when we're talking about sustainability of business is sustainability in the supply chain, the environmental cost accounting. When we're looking at the supply chain, we're talking about the actions that come from resource, uh, or raw material sourcing, all the way to the final consumer. So every step along that process, we're generating waste, and we're wasting resources. So when we look at the supply chain, it's a very holistic approach that we need to take, and it's a very difficult thing to create a sustainable supply chain. And when we're talking about environmental accounting, talking about a very abstract idea. It's almost entirely impossible to attribute you know, the cost that we incur on the future by degrading the environment. And that's the type of thing that financial leaders are going to have to deal with. You know, how can we apply a dollar value to what we're doing today and how that affects the future or how that affects the entire ecosystem. But the importance of environmental accounting is our ability to rationalize the transition to sustainability. If it's always cheaper to do the dirty and inappropriate thing, then we'll never make any progress. And that's why it's one of the most important fundamentals of sustainable development. So this is Puma, probably a company that all of you are actually familiar with, something that you might have heard of. Um, they manufacture athletic wear. But Puma, four years ago, um, they were the first <coughs> first environmental crop of a moss statement. And what they were able to do was assign $206 million to environmental damages. And these were in areas such as water usage, land usage, air pollution, and waste creation, among others, of course. And it wasn't an entirely perfect system. I mean, there's, there's faults here, and there's things that can be improved upon. But we don't necessarily expect babies to run. I mean, this is a fantastic step. And it's a model for other companies to base their operations off of. It's something to build on. And so this is a graphical representation of what Puma is able to do. On the left side, you can see the categories that I just talked about. They're able to sign percentages based 
case identifying as a process and what was going on and where the most damages were coming from. So water usage, for instance, was their highest priority. Now on the right side of the graph, you see their suppliers broken down and inside of their supply chain they attributed different environmental factors to higher percentages and lower percentages. So if we look at tier four, which is represented in orange, that's the raw material producing and manufacturing, which is the most intensive part of the industry. So when we're looking at things to improve upon, that's where we want to start. So as an existing company, this is the type of thing that we need to do. And we can't always expect a company to start over. We can't expect them to instantly be sustainable or consider everything that they're doing and try to reinvent it. It's just not feasible. And, and there's many things that can be done better, but Puma is kind of the starting stone. I mean, they're really innovative in the sense that I mean, nobody else has ever done this. And since Puma initiated the environmental profit and loss statement, they also initiated some sort of a program to reinvent their systems, and they're working on intelligent product design. They're working on intelligent supply chain. So implementing this can be the first step for many companies to kind of rationalize future decisions. And to kind of sum everything up, I'd like to move into supply chains, which are you know, the most difficult sense, or the most difficult ideas to kind of grasp, and the most difficult thing to achieve concerning sustainability. Um, we're going to talk about bios in New Zealand, something that's kind of close to my heart based on my efforts here at Rockport. And it's a really unique situation given their position. So biodiesel New Zealand, as they have coined themselves, um, is an operation that produces biodiesel on the small islands of New Zealand. And this is amazing from a supply chain perspective, simply because of their location. With limited resources and their approach to sustainable strategy, it's almost unheard of the type of things that they're able to do. And not only did they remain within the natural resource limits, but Biodiesel New Zealand has been able to coexist with the community, with the society, and with the local food supply. And they do everything right. They start with ethical harvesting. They're utilizing the most efficient modes of transport, which in this instance is pipelines. And they also have zero waste and maximum efficiency. There's not anything wrong with their operation. They do everything from the most sustainable and ecological standpoint possible. But not only do they create renewable energy, but they're also integrating <coughs> renewable energy in their manufacturing processes, kind of closing the entire loop. Every step in the supply chain is considered. And for those of you who don't know, biodiesel requires that we farm soybeans or some sort of other bean to produce an oil. Once that oil is produced, we can turn it into biodiesel through chemical processes. And the operation in New Zealand goes something like this. <coughs> Farmers would grow the beans to produce the oil, and without, without negatively influencing the food supply, and they do this as a break crop. So when farmers need to replenish their soil, they can either grow nothing and fill it with chemicals, or they can grow some sort of bean and replenish the nutrients in that soil. So while farmers in the United States are getting paid to grow nothing, farmers in New Zealand are actually growing fuel for their country. And once, this, once, the, once, the, once the beans and the, the oil is produced, it's sent to New Zealand biodiesel, and they manufacture it into a very clean, sustainable product. And any waste that's associated with that process is re-implemented into the system and animal and food products. And to send it home, as some of you may or may not know, biodiesel is actually a completely non-toxic and biodegradable substance, which eliminates the concern for creating harmful and toxic chemicals and that sort of thing in our products. And we're creating a human healthy and a human safe product here, which completely sums up sustainability. <clears throat> so as an overall recap, you know, these are the fundamental ideas of sustainability in business. And these are considerations that aren't the typical band-aid on the wound. These are things that can heal the entire system if we consider them and we implement them properly. And it's important to remember that the political and the business 
business-oriented need for cleanup and the business, uh, the business-oriented need for regulation, there's significant signs of failure. You know, we have the ability, the technology, and the options to solve the preliminary problems. And if we can do that, we can avoid everything in the first place. Now, it's important to recognize that those aren't only the options. Sustainability is the best option. So I want to end the presentation today with a quote that kind of sums up my feelings on the sustainability movement. And what I hope to have done today is kind of illustrate you know, the value, demonstrated some stories, and kind of educated you on the basic fundamentals of sustainability in business. You know, as leaders and as a society, as seekers of higher education, it's important that we recognize the opportunities that we all have moving forward. So as you progress in your career, whether you're destined for business or not, there exist responsibilities that you have to pursue. We have to make the intelligent options, we have to make the intelligent decisions. In order to make sense of it all, you know, business has to correct itself. And if business can correct itself, I think all of us can correct ourselves. And it's reasonable to say that if one person can do it, then perhaps all of us can do it. And the companies that I've demonstrated today are perfect examples of that. So by seeking, by seeking further education and innovation, spreading sustainability throughout our lives. We better prepare ourselves for the future, and we may better serve our future generations. Now, and always remember the fact that we've depended on the environment for so long, but at this point, the environment has to depend on us. Thank you very much.